Case number two, special or part-time teaching and writing for publication. The second case for discussion involves United States District uh, Judge Solomon and uh, what she finds to be a very appealing offer from the Wise Law School to serve as an intercession judge in residence. The first question uh, focuses on the issues other than financial that she needs to address before uh, responding to this invitation. Canon 4 and its commentary recognize that a judge is in a unique position to contribute to the improvement of the law, the legal system, and the administration of justice. And teaching is, of course, one way of doing this and is encouraged not only because of that fact, but also because teaching often helps one to become and be a more effective judicial officer. Canon 4 does impose two uh, restrictions, however, on outside law-related activities, including teaching. The first is that the activity must not interfere with the performance of your judicial duties. And the second is that the activity must not cast doubt on your capacity to decide impartially any issue that may come before you. Uh, le let me ask my colleagues here, uh, acceptance of this invitation uh, by Judge Solomon is going to mean uh, many hours of preparation, uh, and then it's going to mean two weeks away from chambers on campus. Thereafter, she's going to have to consult with students about their research projects, and she, of course, will ultimately have to grade papers. Uh, particularly in light of the fact that Judge Solomon anticipates writing a book this year and also plans to spend a three weeks vacation with her family at the lake this summer. Uh, does, this, does this create uh, any problems? Well, I don't know that there's an objective problem from the amount of time that you've outlined, Walt, because in my experience, uh, our judges have such different capacities some of them can do all of their work uh, and then write God knows how many books on the side, appear at an infinite uh, number of uh, legitimate uh, fora, uh, and still have time left over. It's not true of all judges. I think the three things that Judge Solomon ought to think about, and if she requests permission subsequently from her chief judge to undertake uh, this engagement uh, that he or she ought to think about, uh, one, uh, will her absence uh, in any significant way cause a dislocation, uh, necessity to reallocate the court's work? Will she, in fact, during the year be pulling down her full share of the court's work so that special arrangements don't have to be made, so that she is taken off a trial or is not assigned a trial that she would normally uh, expect to get? The second would be to look at her record uh, and to see whether or not, in truth, uh, she is one of our quick judges or one of our really slow judges. Uh, I would be very reluctant if I were her or if I were her chief judge to sanction even uh, this uh, relatively modest intercession. If she was a judge who had uh, 20 uh, cases in which she hadn't uh, yet um, uh, issued the significant ruling or uh, the final opinion. Uh, there's a third more subtle factor, uh, which when you've been around courthouses for a while, you recognize. And that is, even if you get all of your judicial work done, and many judges can do it and still do an enormous amount of outside activities, uh, there is a dynamic going on in the courthouse, which means that a judge ought to be there most of the time, even if he or she uh, can do their work elsewhere or has pulled down their full share of the formal work. We get enormous amounts of emergency motions, uh, emergency proceedings, and pretty soon you find that certain judges are known to take a disproportionate amount of that emergency activity because they're always there and they can be called upon. And others, uh, the word gets around, uh, well, they're never there, or you, you gotta make sure they're gonna be there. Uh, that's a very subtle factor, but I think an important one, and I think a judge who really wants to pull his or her weight 
ought to take uh, account of. I don't think objectively the amount of time that's involved here is uh, in and of itself uh, enough to say no, but I think it's significant enough so that she has to think about uh, all of those factors, uh, how fast she's going to get her work done and how much time totally throughout the year she's going to be out of the courthouse. Jim, uh, in her seminar on the federal judicial process, uh, Judge Solomon will undoubtedly want to address several uh, thorny issues of federal jurisdiction that she may well be called upon to uh, decide in her court. Does, does this mean that she can't accept this teaching assignment because uh, it may cast doubt on her capacity to uh, decide those issues impartially as a judge? I think the answer today is, is uh, uh, no, she can teach it and it won't cast uh, doubt on her ability to decide these cases uh, fairly. There was a time, I think, when the answer might have been different, uh, when uh, 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 many judges were reluctant to express their views. Uh, uh, on, a, on a variety of issues. Uh, but I think that Canon 4, which encourages legal scholarship, uh, legal work outside the bench, uh, by necessity means that, uh, that a judge can write a book and express views on particular issues, uh, which that judge may later have to decide. Uh, there are, I think, some situations where the circumstances may be so aggravated that a judge will have to recuse if an issue is extremely narrow, highly controversial, uh, on which the judge has expressed very, very clear views over a long period of time. Uh, and the question is quite specific. Uh, to, the, to the extent that one can say the judge's ruling is absolutely, utterly uh, predictable, and nothing could possibly change this judge's minds, no development of the law, no change in circumstances, then perhaps a judge ought to, uh, to recuse. But in that unlikely situation, uh, is, uh, 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 that unlikely situation alone is not enough, in my view, to, uh, to uh, justify telling a judge, no, you can't write on these issues that are before you. Uh, uh, I think Canon 4 just points in the other direction. Assuming that Judge Solomon uh, resolves that she wants to do this, uh, she's going to have to decide whether she can accept the compensation and the reimbursement that's been uh, tendered by the law school. First, uh, of course, she needs to consider the Ethics Reform Act of 1989 it prohibits a judge from receiving an honorarium, which the act defines as anything of, receiving anything of value for a speech, appearance, or an article. And of course, in a sense here, Judge Solomon will be making an appearance and giving a speech, but under the judicial conference regulations, it's clear that the compensation that she's been offered would not be an honorarium. The Reform Act makes it clear that Congress did not mean to foreclose compensation for a judge's teachings, uh, teaching, and the regulations say that anything that's part of an accredited institution's educational program is teaching, uh, whether or not a traditional course uh, is involved. The Ethics Act also says that a judge's, quote, outside earned income, unquote, for any calendar year cannot exceed 15% of the basic pay of a cabinet level officer. And the judicial conference regulations implementing the act give you uh, a judge uh, guidance in uh, what constitutes outside earned income. Uh, and uh, under those regulations, it's clear that this compensation would be considered outside earned income uh, so she will need to, uh, Judge Solomon will need to make sure that this, when added to her other outside earned income for the year, doesn't exceed the 15 percent cap. Uh, Judge Solomon should also consult those regulations before she negotiates the contract for her book. Uh, royalties are excluded uh, from outside earned income, but certain uh, advances are not. Canon 6 imposes some additional restrictions on the receipt of compensation. 
basically it says that there are three requirements. You can receive a compensation, uh, number one, if it's reasonable in light of the services you're rendered, two, if it's no more than a non-judge would receive for the same uh, services, and finally, if it doesn't give the appearance of impropriety for some other reason. Expense uh, reimbursement is all right as long as the expenses are reasonably incurred by the judge or uh, by the judge's spouse, quote, where appropriate to the occasion. Um, now, in Judge Solomon's case, part-time faculty members receive uh, $4,000 to $4,500 for teaching an entire semester, and the only people that have received as much as $7,000 from uh, Wise Law School for a thing like an intercession are office holders and, and former office holders. Uh, Jim, do you think that creates a problem for Judge uh, Solomon? I don't think it, it creates a problem. Uh, uh, there is a, a difference, clearly, between what is being required uh, of the judge in this two-week intercession period and what is required of the ordinary part-time faculty. Uh, it is clear that the price that is being paid this judge was paid to other people and other people who are not judges. Uh, so one does not, uh, can't you, I don't think you can reach the conclusion that the, the fee is being paid simply because Solomon is a judge. The other requirement, of course, is that the fee in and of itself be reasonable. Uh, uh, and that kind of analysis I think we're all used to making. In, in, in this case, if you look at the number of hours that are spent, uh, because the two weeks are very intense, and then another number of hours spent after the two weeks involving the student papers, you're looking at a rate of compensation that I think would not be too much different from that uh, which uh, uh, you would arrive at if we all took our salaries and divided them by 2,000 uh, hours a year, although I don't think too many of us work just 2,000 hours a year. Uh, it's not out of line with the compensation that, uh, that uh, Congress itself has set for, for the judge's work. So I think the $7,000 is not a problem. Pat, uh, is this uh, a, quote, appropriate occasion for Judge Solomon to bring her spouse uh, to the campus at the law school's expense? Well, appropriate occasion is a very open-ended phrase, but some of the things that I would look at in the situation is, uh, why is she being asked? Is she being asked solely because uh, of her uh, great fount of knowledge on law and literature and on some of these other things, or is she, as the title suggests, being asked because she is some kind of a role model or a voice from the outside. She's called an intercession juror judge in residence. So clearly she's not your ordinary garden variety of a faculty member being uh, asked solely uh, for her expertise in a particular field. I would say it's probably appropriate because she's going to be uh, engaged in a lot of contact with faculty and with students. So I think that especially since uh, Judge Solomon is a woman judge and it, uh, she presents um, a somewhat unique uh, front to the students, having her husband there showing that it is possible to have a satisfactory, constructive, supportive uh, family relationship uh, probably has an educational benefit of its own. I assume also since she's there for an intense period and called a judge in residence, there'll be lots of lunches and there'll be dinners with other faculty members at which their spouses will be there. Why would we consign her to dance alone, as it were, for this entire period? Uh, the kind of uh, thing that I could, the kind of occasion I could envision that would not be appropriate might be a full-time working session of a task force which was trying to put together, uh, I don't know, re uh, regulations, rules, uh, something where you're working around the clock except for a bite here and there, and it's clear that the spouse is serving no function at all by being there. But I think on the whole it's okay. Okay, as, uh, let's move along to the third question. Uh, assuming that uh, Judge Solomon decides to take compensation, then the answer to question three is clear and simple. Uh, because the teaching will be compensated, the Ethics Reform Act requires that Judge Solomon get permission in advance 
from the chief judge of her circuit. The regulations uh, of the judicial conference will tell her the kind of information she needs to provide to her circuit chief uh, when she's seeking to get uh, his or her consent. Um, now, there may be an issue or two here uh, raised by the fact that Judge Solomon uh, plans to use uh, her chamber's uh, resources and her staff to assist in uh, helping her prepare for the seminar and to write her book. Canon 4 uh, prohibits any substantial use of chamber's resources or staff for law-related activities. Uh, the first point I want to make is that Canon 4 here is talking about a judge's outside law-related activities. Uh, we're not talking about activities that the judge engages in uh, as a part of his regular responsibilities. When a judge is asked by a local bar association to go speak upon his, about his uh, adjustment to the bench or about uh, the local rules that are about to be uh, promulgated, uh, he's speaking, uh, that's part of his responsibilities as a judge, and there aren't any restrictions on the use of Chambers' resources. I think we're all in agreement on that. Uh, he can use his secretary to type his speech, and um, he, there is no restriction. But that's not what we're talking about here. When we're talking about teaching, we're not talking about Judge Solomon's official uh, activities. We're talking about outside law-related activities. And the canon says that she uh, can only make insubstantial use of her uh, public uh, resources. The canon and advisory opinions 79 and 80 recognize that it's impossible for a judge not to make some use of chambers' uh, resources if you're going to be involved in outside activities. Nevertheless, uh, canon 4 says you can only make insubstantial use. Now, what does that mean, and what problems do you all see with uh, Judge Solomon's uh, plans here? Pat? Well, the biggest problem, of course, is uh, defining uh, what is insubstantial uh, use. Um, I, I'm assuming uh, that that means that uh, the secretary can't type the manuscript for the book. I'm also assuming that the law clerk could only be used in a very insignificant way if you said, Jay, would you uh, check the site of these four cases, but not would you go out and find all the law review articles that have been written on the following topic and summarize them for me. Uh, so those, I think, um, are the primary things that come to my mind. Obviously, you can't use the frank in any kind of uh, back and forth communications with the press. Uh, I'm going to leave to Jim to discuss some of the ramifications uh, of using computer-assisted legal research uh, in your computers for that kind of work. I will say that I think that this is an area which our committee, uh, upon inquiry, um, really, uh, we have made a start with opinion 79 and 80, but will have to be fleshed out in the future. In my experience, in 12 years on the bench, it is perhaps the canon least understood and perhaps most often uh, violated. And I think it's going to take a real educational effort on all our behalfs, old judges and new, to really uh, get through to them that this canon uh, that, uh, and the way it's being interpreted really means what it says, that you can't really use those law clerks and secretaries for the teaching and the speeches, which are not an intrinsic part of your judicial function. But before we leave the subject of staff and go on with Jim and, and other chambers' resources, does it make a difference here? The hypothetical says that Judge Solomon is p taking out of her own pocket and providing uh, compensation, additional compensation, for the work she's asking her staff to do. Does that make a difference? I think... Probably not, although I certainly don't pretend to be, uh, have the definitive answer on this. My own feeling is that you get into a somewhat dangerous area uh, when you start saying to these people who work so intensely with you as a law clerk and a secretary does, hey, I want you to come in and do this, but I'll pay you extra. Uh, you get into a very odd situation of there saying, well, you don't need to pay me. I don't want to take the money 
or I'll do it on my extra time. Um, I, I would tend to think that it shouldn't make a great difference. But I understand that this is an area in which there is definitely difference of opinion. There, there is difference of opinion. The Committee on Codes of Conduct in uh, Advisory Opinion 79 has taken the position that it does not solve the problem for you to provide extra compensation. Well, I agree with yeah. that. Jim, how about uh, using the other chamber's resources other than staff? Well, we do have, uh, in, in our opinions, essentially three rules, one of which was uh, already discussed, which is you can't use the staff, even if you pay them. Uh, the second clear rule that we have is, is if some use of some chamber's facility does not impose any measurable in incremental cost on the government, uh, such as using the books in your library, uh, uh, using the chairs, the desk, the table, uh, using a government pen, uh, these things uh, do not, as we say, impose measurable incremental costs, and by definition, tend we, we think of them as insubstantial. Uh, and I think that's the best definition of insubstantial. The third rule that we've applied is that if, if some activity does impose some incremental cost which is not trivial, uh, then that constitutes substantial use if the judge does not compensate the government for its use. If the judge compensates the government for its use, the judge is in effect using the judge's own resources and not the government's. And we don't really have a question of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, use of, uh, of chambers' What's resources. What's an example of that, Judge? I think uh, uh, computer-assisted legal research. Uh, and even there, sometimes lines are difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, devise. If, for example, a judge uh, uh, has prepared a lecture, prepared a law review article, and relies on one particular case, maybe in an obscure jurisdiction as an example of something, and at the very last minute, before it's going to be sent away to the printer, turns to the computerized legal research and shepherdizes the case. Uh, the, the cost to the government of that particular act is likely to be very trivial, and that constitutes insubstantial use. But if you, if you wind up, I would suppose, with, with the more significant charges, if you've uh, done computer-aided legal research in the traditional sense by doing word searches and linking them, uh, then I think uh, you have, uh, have to pay the government. Uh, if you, uh, for example, conduct a lot of business uh, over a long-distance telephone and you use the private number that most judges have in their chambers and it's, it's, uh, it's your uh, 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 private business, Fax you have to compensate the, the big, government. Is the big operation Fax now. machines also are, are another example of this express mail or court mail. Uh, if these things are used, uh, there ought Xerox to be. Machines. 2,000 right. copies, uh, if you don't reimburse, uh, it's a substantial use. It raises use. an interesting problem for court administration, though, because as a former chief judge, if you have to pull out uh, of uh, the total amount of computer-assisted uh, legal research that the court has, which is all part of one entire Judiciary Act uh, uh, budget, uh, and allocate it to the chambers, or you have to uh, figure out the number of Xerox uh, pages. Um, um. Well, I, I actually think that raises another issue because I think it is incumbent upon the judge who is using uh, uh, these materials and the these estimate. resources to make the estimate, okay. to keep track. Uh, I, I don't think a judge who is using resources in these circumstances is free to say to the chief judge or the figure clerk, out. figure it out and send me the bill. I think uh, the judge has an affirmative obligation to make a reasonable estimate and pay it and not wait uh, to be billed. Uh, finally, uh, there's the issue raised by the fact that Judge Solomon uh, runs into uh, the uh, country's leading uh, expert on the use of uh, uh, statistics to prove uh, discrimination in employment discrimination cases, a professor there at uh, Wise Law School. And it so happens that it's a, a very fortunate meeting because she has just uh, finished hearing a long employment discrimination case. She heard uh, much expert testimony that she didn't really understand. And she sees this as a wonderful, uh, fortuitous opportunity. Can she 
asked the good professor to help her understand what the witnesses before her said, Pat? I don't think not with any specificity. I think she cannot go in and say, uh, Dr. X, I had a witness who came before me and said that you must use the one-tailed test in these circumstances and the two-tailed test in those circumstances. Uh, do you think that that's credible testimony? Um, I think what she may do, if it's helpful to her, and the less specific you get sometimes, the less helpful is the advice, uh, she may talk generally about, uh, with him about whether or not uh, in his experience uh, and in his works he has favored the one tail over the two tail, uh, and if so, for what reasons. Although even that, I think, might get a little, um, a little uh, touchy. I suppose if, if there is something in one of his texts, if he has written a text, then uh, that's out there in the public domain, and she says, uh, in such and such a paragraph, you discuss this. I'm not sure I fully understand what that means uh, or why you said that. Uh, that kind of general uh, discussion uh, on statistics uh, in general would be okay, but the closer she gets to any testimony uh, before her case, or even to uh, the very specific issue in her case, uh, the more I think she gets into the realm of ex-party communications, which the other sides minimally would have to know about, and in my experience would probably object vociferously to. Jim, I, I, ag I agree completely. It, what, what the judge does, if the judge gets specific, is the court is in essence calling an expert witness, hearing the testimony of that expert witness outside the presence of the parties and the lawyers, and not giving any opportunity to cross-exam. If you look at it that way, you realize that it's just not uh, an appropriate thing to do, although it's very understandable. And I think this rule, too, uh, is probably subject to some obviously inadvertent violation by many judges. And it, this will continue to occur, to occur as long as we have uh, a, an increased emphasis on judicial training. Judges go to seminars. You hear an expert. The expert's very helpful. Uh, to issues that trouble the judge, you talk to the expert. Uh, and you really have to refrain uh, from doing that. It, it's, it may be, in some respects, an anomalous rule, because if you don't actually consult with the expert face to face, but you pull the expert's book down from a shelf in the court's library, and you rely on it in one of your opinions, even though neither party cited it, this is permissible. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's always been uh, something that uh, lawyers have understood may occur, but that you actually consulted with somebody and, uh, and, and found their, their statements to you persuasive on the basis of their demeanor. Well, let, me, let me raise an in-between question, which has come up. Uh, we know that you can go and pull down the law review article, and I suppose theoretically you might say both parties, if they were smart enough, could have gone in the library and pulled down the same law review article. And I think we agree that you don't take the expert aside and say, well, this uh, came up in our case. But what often happens is a judge will go to a bar association symposium, a bar association, as a member of the audience, uh, or sometimes as a member of the panel, and then somebody will bring up a case, uh, if it's a high visibility case, that the judge is sitting on that has not yet been decided. I've had that happen to me. Uh, do you think then you have to get up and walk out uh, so that you don't hear the discussion about that case? Um, Obviously, you don't participate in it. But. I, 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 my answer to that would be uh, uh, if, if you can conveniently do so, you ought to. If you can't uh, do so, you ought to advise the parties that this discussion did occur in your presence and that to the best of your ability, you ignored it and will not consider it, which is exactly what we have to do in bench trials when we hear offers of proof on evidence we've excluded. The canons do expressly provide that the court has the, the, the judge has the right to go to a professor and mm -hmm. consult about the case, uh, but he, he or she has to advise the parties of the subject matter of the advice given and give them a chance to comment so that it's not, it's not something that many judges use. In my experience, a lot. I've never known a judge to use that. Yeah. I don't know whether I have. you yeah. have. Yeah. Well, I, uh, all I can say is I, I, I wish I were Judge Solomon. <laughs> it was going to have the fun of going uh, and uh, being an uh, in-residence intercession judge. <laughs>